Coulombic attraction refers to the force of attraction that is felt between two oppositely charged particles. The word Coulomb uh, refers to a unit that measures the quantity of charge that is on something. And attraction refers to a pulling force. So the force of attraction between oppositely charged particles and specifically in this case, we're talking about the force of attraction between positive protons and negative electrons within the atom. Now with any force, some forces are weak, some forces are strong. And so there are gonna be a number of factors that influence just how strong this force of attraction, this Coulombic attraction, is going to be within an atom. This whole idea is based off of Coulomb's law, the equation of which you can see over my shoulder here, and basically that force is going to be equal to the product of the two charged particles, the magnitudes of their charge, divided by the distance between them squared. And so as we go through and we look at each of those factors, the charges of uh, the individual charged particles themselves, and also the distance between those particles, we can refer back to that equation and, and kind of see how the different relationships are established. So if we first consider the denominator of that equation, the d term, the distance, how does the distance between the protons and electrons affect, if it does at all, the uh, amount of the force of attraction? And so if we take a look at the sample set of data here, we see three different trials. We see that in those three separate trials, the number of protons and the number of electrons is being held constant. So those are our controlled variables we see that the distance is changing, as is the force of attraction along the uh, right-hand side of the screen. And so if we take a look at those, it's probably going to deduce that the distance being changed from trial A to B to C is the independent variable. It's the one that's being manipulated because the increment of change is, is nice and, and even. It's a tenth of a nanometer between each trial. Compare that to the force of attraction, and there is definitely a change there, but the, the degree of change or the increment of change isn't as um, nice, for lack of a better word, as we see with the um, distance. And so when we think of what variable is being manipulated on purpose, chances are, uh, as the experimenter, you're going to vary things in a very predictable and set incremental way. So if we look at the relationship that we see here from A to B to C, the distance is increasing. And as the distance is increasing, the force of attraction is decreasing. And so you have one variable that is increasing, one that is decreasing. When they go in opposite directions, we say that that is an inverse relationship. And so based on this data, we would say that distance is inversely related to the Coulombic attractive force. If we take a look at some specific examples from the periodic table, lithium, sodium, potassium all fall in the first column of the periodic table, the alkali metals. And we see that lithium, with its three electrons, two can fit into the first energy level, and that third one needs to begin a second energy level. Sodium has 11, proton, 11 protons and 11 electrons in the neutral atom, so two, first two go in the first level, Electrons 3 through 10 go in the second level, and then that fills the second level, so then that 11th electron begins the third level. Potassium has 19, again, 2 in the first, 8 in the second. The next 8 go into third, and then again, that's at capacity, so then the 19th electron goes in the fourth level. Here's the point. If you look at the periodic table, all right, lithium is in row 2, period 2. It's got two energy levels. Sodium is in row 3, period 3 of the periodic table. It's got three energy levels. Potassium, row 4, period 4, it's got four energy levels. So when you look at an element's position on the periodic table, how far down the table you are gives you a rough idea of how many energy levels are present for the electrons to inhabit. And the more electrons there are, the more energy levels you're going to need. Well, the more levels you have, the more layers there are to the atom, so to speak, the bigger that distance is going to be. So when we look at the key here and we see that the thicker the arrow is, the stronger the force of attraction, we can understand why lithium, the smallest of the atoms, has the greatest force of attraction. Because the distance between that outermost energy level and the nucleus is the smallest. 
smaller the distance, greater the force of attraction. So now if we turn our attention to the top of Coulomb's law and those Q terms, remember protons and electrons, those are our two charged particles. So let's tackle the protons first. If we look at this data set, we see that the distance and the number of electrons are both being held constant. But as we look at these four trials, and A we saw in the first one, uh, the three new ones are D, E, and F, we see that how they're changing is we're incrementing adding one proton with each trial. And as a result, we can see that the force of attraction is changing as well. So as we go from trial A to D to E to F, the number of protons is increasing, and the force of attraction is responding by increasing as well. So we have two variables that are changing in the same direction. Number of protons increases, force of attraction increases. When you have two variables that go in the same direction, we say that they are directly related to one another. Now, one thing to note here, not only are they directly related, if you notice, from A to D, we, go, we double the number of protons. And if we look at the force of attraction, it also doubles, changes by the same numeric factor. A to E, we're tripling, the number of protons, and the force of attraction also triples. So whenever your variables change by the same numeric uh, factor, we say that they are proportional. And because they're changing in the same direction, in this case, they are directly proportional. Again, looking at specific element groupings on the periodic table, if we look in uh, period 3, row 3, we see sodium and aluminum and chlorine. Now, all three are in the same row of the periodic table, so like I said previously, you can take that to mean that they've got the same number of energy levels to hold all of their electrons. So, in effect, the distance really isn't changing, and you can see that by the length of these three arrows representing the Coulombic attractive force. But we do see that, definitively, there is an increase in the Coulombic attractive force as we go from sodium, atomic number 11, to aluminum, atomic number 13, to chlorine, atomic number 17. And the reason for that is because of the three, chlorine has the greatest number of protons. As we saw in the modeled example, the more protons there were, the greater the force of attraction. So when we look at elements across a given row, the greater the number of protons, the stronger that force of attraction on those electrons is going to be. So what about the other particle, the number of electrons? Well, if you take a look at your page that you have in your class notebook, there's a question posed to you there. And for that question, I'm going to go back up here a second, and we're going to take a look at this trial D. And the question is this. If you had this same setup with the addition of another electron, so two electrons total in the system, and that second electron were out here to the left of the two protons. Same distance as the other one, 0.10 nanometers. It's just on the opposite side. What would be true about the force of attraction? Do you think it would be the same as what we had in model D? Would it be less? Would it be more? When you think about that, you can probably justify some different reasons. You know, one might say, well, it's the same distance, so should be the same force of attraction. You might also say, well, if you add a second electron, that's two electrons and two protons, that's a one-to-one -one ratio. Kind of like trial A was, and trial A was 2.30 times 10 to the negative eighth newtons. So if you add a second electron, you cut the force of attraction in half. Seems like a reasonable explanation. When we take a look, though, and we gather some more information, we get some more data, what we see is, is that, in fact, the force of attraction really doesn't change a whole lot. But notice that we do put this approximate on there. And the reason that's there is because the forces at play inside the atom aren't just as simple as attraction between the positive protons and the negative electrons. You also have electrons in the vast majority of atoms that are going to come close to one another, and they're going to interact as well. And we know opposites attract, well, like charges repel. And so with like charges repelling, that means that if these two electrons get close to one another, they're going to push off. 
One of them is going to get pushed a little bit closer to the nucleus, shorter distance, greater attractive force. The other one's going to get pushed further away. And so your actual Coulombic attractive force is going to fluctuate a little bit, but it's going to stay relatively the same as if it were just a single electron. So the number of electrons does not appreciably affect the Coulombic attractive force. There's a minor effect, but to the number of sig figs that we're looking at in our measurements of force, it's not going to make an appreciable difference. So what if these two factors, the distance between the protons and the electrons and the number of protons, what if they seem to contradict each other? And so if we go back to that first example from the periodic table, lithium had three protons, sodium had 11 protons, potassium had 19 protons. And so one would say, well, potassium's got the greatest number of protons, it should have the strongest Coulombic attractive force. But you can see from the diagram here that's not the case. And so if we consider the other thing that's different, lithium only has two electron levels, sodium has three, potassium has four. So potassium, even though it's got 19 positive protons, its electrons are a further distance away. And when it comes down to the two, when both factors are in play, distance between the protons and electrons is going to take precedent over the number of protons that are in the atom. So here are four examples. These are the same ones that are in your class notebook page. At this point, I'd like you to take what we've talked about, what you've learned in this video, pause the video for a moment, try answering these questions on your own. You can use a periodic table so you can find these elements and compare where they're at on uh, their atomic numbers, things like that. And then once you've come up with some answers on your own, go ahead and resume uh, and, and hear the explanation for them. All right, so the first one, which element will have the greater Coulombic attractive force? When we look at potassium versus uh, krypton, potassium's got 19 protons, and uh, krypton has 36 protons. And they're both in the same row of the periodic table. They're both in period four. So effectively, the, diff the number of rings or levels that there are is the same. So the distance effectively is, is the same. So we're not going to be looking at distance as our determining factor. We're going to depend on the number of protons. And again, krypton's got 36 compared to potassium's 19. So krypton is going to be the element that has the greater Coulombic attractive force. In the second example, which element will have the smaller Coulombic attractive force between magnesium and barium? When you compare their positions, you see that magnesium is in period 3, whereas barium is in period 6. So that means that barium has six energy levels, six rings, if you will, in its diagram, versus magnesium's three. And so because the question is asking, in this case, for the smaller Coulombic attractive force, remember that the greater the distance, the smaller the attractive force is. So in this case, we want the bigger atom, and that would be barium with its six energy levels. In the third example, rank the following elements in order of increasing Coulombic attraction. So we want to start with the low value and go to the high value. And we've got nickel, calcium, and selenium. All of those are found in period four of the periodic table. And so we see that nickel is in the center with the uh, transition metals. Calcium is an alkaline earth metal um, in the second column. And selenium is in group 16 underneath oxygen there, again, in period four. And so because they're all in period four, they all have the same number of energy levels. So distance essentially is the same. So we go by the number of protons. And the greater, greater the number of protons, the higher the Coulombic attractive force. So from smallest to largest, we would be calcium, then nickel, and then selenium, based on the number of protons in each. In the last set, we want to rank the following elements in order of decreasing Coulombic attraction. So in this case, we're going to start with the strongest and then end with the weakest Coulombic attraction. And so lead, carbon, and tin, all of those elements are in the same column. They're in the same family. And so whenever you're comparing elements in a vertical column, the number of protons is going to increase, but also 
the number of energy levels that you have and hence the distance. And remember, when both factors are in play, distance is the determining factor. So in this case, uh, if we're going from decreasing, that means that the most, uh, the strongest Coulombic attraction is going to be from the smallest atom, the one with the fewest energy levels, that would be carbon. And then next in order would be tin. And then finally lead, which has the greatest number of energy levels, therefore the greatest distance, and the weakest Coulombic attractive force.